Okay, hello, welcome. Um, my name is Eric Carver. I'm a, a doctoral candidate here in architecture, and um, I'm joined by um, uh, Jeanette Kim on this project. Um, she, of course, is a uh, faculty in architecture and uh, co-founder and director of uh, the Urban Landscape Lab. Um, and the, the title uh, for tonight's event, How Do I Stop Worrying and Love Nuclear Energy, um, is, um, in case there are questions, it's, it's, it's actually a reference to the 1964 film, uh, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop worrying and love the bomb. Um, but it shouldn't be seen as either a kind of pro-nuclear or anti-nuclear um, conversation here tonight, but rather um, sort of a genuine question. How do we learn to stop worrying? Okay. And um, whether that happens tonight or, or somewhere down the road, um, I think it's, it's an open question right now. Um, um, but it, the, the event tonight conversation grows out of a series that we had um, last year at Studio X, um, the Underdome Sessions, um, which was a series of conversations about uh, the, the different energy strategies and their, their implications for public life. Um, and the, the, given all the concern um, by architects and questions of energy these days, um, how uh, looking at, it, at what's happening in a kind of larger sense in other fields um, could inform um, questions of architectural agency. Um, so along with the, uh, the, the sessions, we, um, there was, um, we put together uh, uh, this website, theunderdome.net, um, um, which was uh, supported by the Van Allen Institute um, and it kind of maps out um, different sets of strategies um, concerning energy and uh, public life. Um, and we also uh, are coming out with a print version of this um, with support from the Graham Foundation. <clears throat> um, and of course, uh, Much has happened uh, uh, since last year, uh, 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 especially uh, kind of poignant event has been uh, Fukushima. Um, and um, for many people, the, the, the um, trauma of, of Fukushima has, has meant the, the death of nuclear energy. Um, and um, whether uh, nuclear energy is, is actually dead or not, it, it continues to live on in many ways. Um, so for example, you know, over 25% of the lights here tonight are, are uh, powered by nuclear energy. Um, and 20% um, of the country as a whole is um, still reliant on it. So we will be, um, we'll continue to live with um, nuclear power for years and, and radiation, you know, for centuries to come. Um, uh, so al along with the sort of infrastructural questions um, that we want to consider, there's also the, 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 I guess, cultural questions. The atomic age was an age of uh, great optimism. The idea that, that um, the products of, of science and technology could be used to serve uh, mankind rather than employed for death and destruction. Um, the idea that, that power could be um, widely available, um, that, that we'd see an end to scarcity. Um, um, a set of ideals that, that um, would seem to also be, be threatened um, you know, by, by the, the death of um, nuclear energy. Um, anyway, so we want to consider tonight both the spatial practices and the, the changing perceptions, whether these are perceptions of risk or opportunity um, in, uh, around, around the questions of um, nuclear energy. So um, I just want to, I should, with that, I should go into um, kind of introductions for the three panelists um, who will be presenting their work and then we'll have time 
Janet will come up and um, um, kind of organize the discussion. Um, so first of all, right here we have Matthew Wald. Um, <laughs> Matthew is a, is a reporter for the New York Times. He's based out of the Washington Bureau and he's um, reported on environment and energy. Um, he's been working on civilian nuclear power since Three Mile Island. Um, and he's um, toured dozens of uh, reactors. Um, he's, he's been to Yucca Mountain twice, yes. was it? Um, and he's also written on the production of materials for nuclear weapons, um, as well as the disposal, disposal, and recently he's also been writing about batteries, the electric grid, and alternative energy. Um, um, second, we'll have uh, Rania Gozen. Um, she's an architect and geographer. She's an assistant professor at um, University of Michigan in the architecture department. Um, and she's also the founding editor of New Geographies, um, the journal from the GSD, um, and uh, as well as the editor of uh, the Landscapes of Energy book that many of you are familiar with. Um, um, and then finally, we'll have um, Christopher Marskinkowski. Um, he's the founding director of Port Architecture and Urbanism, um, which recently won the, the WPA 2.0 award. Um, he's an assistant professor of landscape architecture and urban design over at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, and previous to that, he was an associate at um, Field Operations, James, James Corner. Um, so I think. So I think um, that's it, um, and um, there's a, a lot, a lot of um, information we want to get through, and so we'll just get started. Uh, thank you. Good evening to everyone. Thank you, Eric and Jeanette, for inviting me. I want to start by putting in a brief commercial for the New York Times, my employer, for the last 30 years. We don't actually ask that you read the paper every day. And in fact, you don't even have to buy the paper every day. It's just when you buy anything, you, you know, you're opening up the box and there's that little card or you gotta go online to register it for the warranty and it asks, how did you hear about our product? You must, you must check the box that says newspaper advertising. Okay, that's all, end of commercial. Uh, and how do I advance? So if I push the arrow button, it's gonna, okay. Uh, this is, uh, we can talk a little bit about the images of nuclear power, uh, how nuclear power fits in with our energy system and our built environment, and how it's portrayed in the media. This is a 50-year-old concept car concept. It was supposed to go 5,000 miles between refuelings. To refuel, you took the nuclear reactor off and put on a new one, but I can't figure out which end is the back. Uh, let's not go into ridiculous details about what people thought of nuclear power in 1958, but take the broader point that a lot of new technologies don't pan out the way you thought they would. And here's another way nuclear power gets portrayed. Uh, one of the characteristics that nuclear power shares, this is by Bob Enkelhart in the Hartford Current, uh, one of the ways that uh, the characteristics nuclear shares with oil is that it's done by big corporations. And at the moment, we have an ideological attraction to small. We don't like big. This is independent of engineering merit, and in fact, is in even independent of the technology. Take solar, for example. Right now, we're subsidizing home rooftop solar, even though the same subsidy could buy 20 or 30% more electricity if applied to commercial installations or utility scale installations. But our aesthetic sense is we like them small, uh, alas, uh, just like the Ford Nucleon, the uh, small nuclear reactor isn't likely. And here's one more. Uh, here we go. Uh, this, is, this woman was a contestant in the 2007 Miss Nuclear Beauty Pageant in Russia. I can't actually show you the winning entry, and I don't know what color her bikini was before the radiation. Uh, and here's another one. This, this is the Cooper Station on the Missouri River. Actually, I was out there two months ago and it was in the Missouri River because the river was overflowing. The industry sometimes tries to de demonize itself. Northeast Utilities used to send out a Christmas card with some 
fir trees in the foreground, this unbroken field of snow, and in the background, the containment dome of Connecticut Yankee. Uh, power plants are not inherently attractive places, although nuclear is not as ugly or noisy as coal. Let me say a few words about how a reactor works. Uh, the core is loaded with a type of uranium that splits easily, and when it splits, it gives off tremendous heat. That is the, the red area here. Um, the heat source is very dense. A fuel pellet the size of a pencil eraser has about as much energy as a ton of coal. It's surrounded by water. We often refer to this as cooling water, but that's a misnomer. It's actually working water. It carries off the heat so it can be used. In this diagram, it's carried off to those yellow boxes, which are turbines. They convert steam into rotary energy that turns the generator and sends power to the grid. The steam is then condensed back to water to be sent back for reheating. You have to condense it to water because it's very hard to heat steam. This means you need huge volumes of cooling water. Indian Point simply sucks the Hudson River water, uh, out, out, water out of the Hudson River, passes it through metal tubes inside a box. Uh, outside the box, excuse me, passes the steam through the metal tubes. Outside is cold river water. The river water goes back to the river a bit cleaner than it entered because it's been filtered but the fish and the baby eggs don't do very well. The high energy density also means the waste is very dense. Oops, I'm sorry. This is a spent fuel pool at an Illinois reactor I visited recently. They're pulling out a cask, the cask that's been loaded with spent fuel. It's got about nine months of fuel from an 1100 megawatt nuclear reactor in it. That's about seven million megawatt hours, which is equal to about 2.8 million tons of coal if you'd burn the coal, you'd have about 20,000 tons of sulfur dioxide, which causes acid rain, about 7.2 million tons of carbon dioxide, which causes climate change unless you're running for president as a Republican, in which case it doesn't, uh, and about 1,000 tons of small particles, which aggravate asthma and other problems. There's a few pounds of mercury, about 225 pounds of arsenic, 230 pounds of lead, et cetera, et cetera. It depends precisely on which coal you're using. Uh, the, according to Oak Ridge National Laboratory, radioactive emissions from the coal plant are higher than from the nuclear plant because one of the components of coal is uranium. If you're not on a big river, you're also evaporating water. You use a cooling tower and the heat is used up evaporating the water. This is true of nuclear and coal. In a nuclear plant, the water is serving a second function in this design. The chain reaction is carried out by subatomic particles called neutrons, which are liberated when you split the nucleus. But when you split the nucleus, they come out at almost the speed of light, and that's too fast to fission another, another nucleus. You have to slow them down. The water slows them down. Um, and one of the nice parts of this design is if you lose the water, the reaction stops. Uh, we can talk about Fukushima, the reaction there stopped, but the fuel was so hot it continued to melt. Let me talk a little bit about nuclear in New York. In a way, the New York area is a peculiarly good setting for nuclear power. The reason is everything else is so difficult and expensive. New York is convenient to nothing except the ocean. We used to bring in oil by tanker through the beginning of the 1980s, and then that got too expensive. Nationally, about half our electricity comes from coal. Con Ed tried to burn coal in the 80s, but it got shot down. We do burn natural gas. The catch is that with natural gas, prices gyrate wildly. Right now, it's about $4 per million BTU. A couple of years ago, the same quantity would have cost you, in 78, the same quantity, excuse me, in 2008, the same quantity would have cost you $14. Uh, a million BTU will give you about 150 kilowatt hours. So what that means in plain English is the price of a kilowatt hour, if you live in an apartment in New York, you use about 250 kilowatt hours a month. Price of a kilowatt hour, has varied, the fuel price has varied from less than three cents to more than nine cents. That's a huge variation. We could build more power lines and bring in hydropower or coal power, but the last high voltage power line built on land in New York was finished in 1988. There's a reason we haven't built any more. People don't like them. And there's a perverse intersection of engineering and politics and design uh, the, more, the better the power line, the more people don't like it because the highest capacity lines are 
monsters, 765 kilovolts, they're 200 feet high. Uh, either you take up a lot of land with low towers or you take up less land with enormous towers and people don't like them. Now, there are plans out there for a national supergrid that will bring in wind power from diverse locations, which is probably essential because if you're going to use wind, you need to spread the wind machines out in various locations so that at any given time you're picking up wind from somewhere. But this is, frankly, this was, com this was uh, drawn by a variety of grid operators coming together with a compromise. Uh, New York and New England withdrew because they decided they'd rather wait for offshore wind. I think they'll be waiting a long time. Uh, this, is a, this is probably $20 billion in transmission, but we just don't have the political capital to do it. The trouble with wind is a single wind machine is either running or it isn't. A string of them over 20 miles or so will show a more even output. Scattered wind machines around the country will help you develop a track record so you can count on a certain level of output. Until you have some understanding of just what you can count on, the wind, or the sun for that matter, can replace the output of a fossil plant, a coal plant, or a natural gas plant, but you can't replace the plant itself. You're going to have to have that standing by because you don't know what, when you're going to have energy from anywhere else. This gets to be a rather expensive proposition. And the wind is kind of fickle. This slide is from the Bonneville Power Administration in the Pacific Northwest. You can see the daily rise and fall in demand. That's the red line at the top. And you can see the wind output, the blue line. It's like running two radio stations at the same time. There's no correlation. It's pointless. This is from Public Service of Colorado. They've got a syncopated electric system. You can see the yellow line is demand peaking and falling every day. And the green line is the wind peaking and falling. Sometimes you're producing more wind than you have demand. Sometimes you have heavy demand and no wind. Uh, this is, and from an engineering s sense, this is not very attractive. These folks are now adding one megawatt of natural gas capacity for every megawatt of wind they add. It's like having two cars because you're pretty, soon, pretty sure that most of the time one of them will be broken down. Nuclear, on the other hand, represents both energy and capacity. That is, it gets the lights on, it can generally be counted to do so, and it's fairly compact. Indian Point sits on 240 acres, and most of that is unused. It produces about 2,200 megawatts of power. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory says a wind farm takes about a quarter of an acre per turbine, presuming a one megawatt turbine. That means 2,200 megawatts, the same as Indian Point, would take about 550 acres. But that's just the peak power. Typically, the wind machine's output at the end of the year is equal to only about a third of what it would have been if it could have run 24-7. Uh, it just is, most of the time, is running slowly or not at all. The reactor, on the other hand, produces 90%. So if you're going to go for renewables, these are all equal in power output. One reactor, you need three times as many uh, wind machines and about six times as much solar. To get the same output as Indian Point, you need about 1,600 acres for wind. That's 2.6 square miles. Now, we've got it. There's a lot of land out there, but we don't have it in New York. The Columbia campus is 32 acres. That's 0.05 square miles. Indian Point's footprint is about 4,800 times larger than the Columbia campus. The wind farm I'm proposing is 32,000 times larger than the Columbia campus. But in a certain sense, Indian Point is a historical artifact. All the reactors now running in the United States were ordered in the 60s and 70s. All of them were finished by 1990, except for one that the builder gave up on for 10 years and then came back and finished. That was finished in 96. There are four new units under construction in the US and one that was ordered in 1970 and abandoned in the 80s that might get finished. Reactors sometimes seem a bit like ocean liners. Their time may have passed. The market structure in the northeastern United States favors low risk and quick returns, so it's easier to build natural gas in very short order and shortly in advance of demand. In the south, the risk still falls on the ratepayer, where you can spread risk among millions of captive customers, and you have a bigger appetite for big projects, which is why South Carolina and Georgia and Alabama are the only likely prospects for new American reactors in the near future. Now, those are the economic reasons. The sexy reasons are safety. 
If I have another minute, I will tell you I don't think we understand fully what happened at Fukushima or in the recent East Coast earthquake. Uh, let's start with a stark truth. Electricity kills people. Making electricity kills people. By extension, using electricity kills people. In February of last year, six people died at a natural gas plant in Connecticut called Clean Energy Systems. In May of last year, the Macondo well blowout, which was oil, we remember, but also natural gas, which goes into electricity, killed 11 and injured 17. In April, the Upper Big Branch mine disaster killed 29 miners. I don't mean to single out fossil fuels. In 2007, a fire at the Cabin Creek hydroelectric system in Colorado killed five workers. It's hard to kill workers in a hydroelectric station, but we can do it. I should go a step farther up the chain. Using electricity kills people. Of course, it also saves people. You can't deliver potable water and wholesome food to a city like New York without using a lot of electricity. Fukushima is a shocker to me because I always figured the next big meltdown would be in China or maybe the next three meltdowns. After all, that's a country that can't regulate the amount of antifreeze in the baby formula. We had a meltdown in Pennsylvania, and if the Pennsylvanians can't get it straight, what hope do we have for anybody else? But it's not yet clear if Fukushima killed anybody. If it did, I suspect the number will be rather modest compared to the 20,000 people who lost their lives in the tsunami. I think the earthquake was a similar problem. Attention immediately went to the nuclear plant. Uh, I was down in Mineral at North Anna, uh, which is still shut but is likely to open in a month or so. Uh, the real damage was to places like the Washington Monument and the National Cathedral, which I read a couple of days ago had $25 million worth of damage, a lot of decapitated gargoyles. But the focus goes to nuclear. We, we have not learned to stop worrying. We like worrying. Thank you. for extending the invitation into a very exciting series, the underground sessions, and for tonight's, uh, yeah, thing. That's better? Okay, perfect. So um, my presence here and my contribution this evening builds on the work that I've been engaged in in new geographies, and particularly the volume landscapes of energy that I've edited. That issue aimed at locating energy spatially, so understanding many of the production systems, but also at distinguishing, distinguishing within that broad social category called energy different modes of production. So that issue in particular looked at fossil fuels and particularly oil, tracing them through a chain of production from extraction through transport, distribution, and eventually many of the contemporary debates we have around renewables in relation to fossil fuels. So that's not exactly what I'm presenting this evening. The subject is actually quite far away, and I've, it's quite of a challenge because it's a bit of an experiment venturing into the land of nuclear, some of which because I, I, haven't, I wasn't able earlier to formulate some framework within which I was able to address the question because it seemed that the question of risk and anxiety were very much focusing on, on that framework. So uh, um, bear, with me, bear with me as I try tonight on what is quite fresh grounds, but I hope that I'll be able to provoke a few questions and maybe some sense of stimulation on how we can gear the discussion. In 1982, the United States Congress established a national policy to solve the problem of nuclear waste disposal. The Nuclear Waste Policy Act made the US Department of Energy responsible for finding a site, building and operating an underground disposal facility called a geologic repository. The basic concept is quite simple. It's to locate a large, stable geologic formation, such as salt formations, to drill a shaft 500 to 1,000 meters below the surface, where rooms or vaults can be excavated for disposal of high-level radioactive waste. In 1999, the Department of Energy approved a waste isolation pilot plan, the YIPP in Carlsbad, New Mexico, to be the world's first permanent underground storage facility for nuclear waste. The YIPP sits on 16 square mile tract of federal <coughs> land and will permanently store around 900,000 drums of plutonium-based defense-related transuranic waste. Most of the waste interred here 
kind of differently to popular perception, consist of contaminated protective clothing, tools, glassware that is yet to be produced. So it kind of deals with the anxiety heritage of a post-Cold War world, but it actually aims to host much of the material that will be produced in, in future, in coming years. The YIPP project design assumes that the desert is a good place, a particularly good place to keep a secret. The facility is not far from the central laboratory of the Manhattan Project and from the site of Trinity, the first nuclear detonation of July 1945, which is often associated with the start of the nuclear age. Many US nuclear tests were subsequently undertaken in neighboring desert areas, Nevada, for example. The establishment of the Nevada Test Ground in January 1951 initiated 40 years of continuous nuclear testing, around 928 nuclear tests in the state of Nevada, initially all above ground. At that time, mushroom clouds were greeted with a potent mixture of apprehension and fascination. The Atomic Energy Commission assured the public that the experimental detonations, as they were called, posed no danger to tourists or residents. And the press followed suit with headlines such as, don't worry folks, bomb blasts won't bother you. The test attracted thousands of visitors to downtown Las Vegas, 60 miles southeast. Hotels began organizing picnics for their guests to watch the blasts. By the spring of 1952, an average of 20,000 people a day were coming to the city for the tests. Following the 1962 limited test ban treaty, all nuclear and many non-nuclear states signed the pledge to refrain from testing nuclear weapons in the atmosphere, underwater, or in outer space. Between 1962 and 1992, nuclear testing in Nevada moved thousands of feet underground. Much of the territory of the Nevada test site is blistered with subsidence craters. The site has been recently requestioned to the Nevada National Security Site in an indirect acknowledgement to a change of anxiety eras from nuclear to national security. The desert was, was, was once again proposed as a good location to keep the secret. On the western periphery of the Nevada site is Yucca Mountain, which, which was proposed to be a deep geological repository storage facility until the project was canceled in 2009. So the issue of the geographical distribution of coast, and particularly the externalization of nuclear tests and wastes to the Algerian Sahara for the French experiments, the Pacific Proving Grounds in the Marshall Islands earlier for the US, the native lands of Australia and Alaska and the like, continues to haunt the debate over energy policy and particularly nuclear. The way that environmentalism has become discursively organized around the interconnectedness of everything provides the very possibility of contesting policies that are geographically and temporally remote and otherwise appear to be casually unrelated. The nuclear desert speaks as well to the broader question of the human's presence, or more precisely, its, ex its exclusion from zones of nature, across the spectrum from contaminated land to promises of deep ecology. The question of the geological depository addresses the discrepancy between the scales of geologic time and human time when it comes to nuclear materials. The Department of Energy has ruled that any permanent nuclear waste depository in the US must have an operative plan that would make it safe for 10,000 years. Though it would account for only a fraction of the lifespan of a material that remains radioactive for hundreds of thousands of years, a 10,000 year safety plan is unprecedented in human history, a task that is simultaneously necessary and impossible. In the initial planning phases of the WIPP project in the early 1980s, the option of not marking the site at all was considered. The idea being that if it were really well hidden in a place where no one could ever think of it or looking for it, the safety of the present and the future could be secured. By 1985, however, the possibility that the disposal site could be designed without a permanent marker system was specifically excluded by the Environmental Protection Agency. Starting in the 1990s, federal authorities created a human interference task force comprised of material scientists, an environmental designer, an anthropologist, a linguist, and even a science fiction writer with the task to design a marking system for the WIPP site. The team proposed a multimodal communication system, inscriptions in seven languages, astronomical diagrams, 
and the periodic table identifying the buried elements, as well as extensive earthwork that plant form signs of danger. Sometimes around 2035, the hole will be filled to capacity and sealed shut. Then, by, the decree, by a decree of the government, a very large monument, in keeping with the magnitude of the burial beneath, is constructed to mark the site. The envisioned earthworks, whether called forbidding blocks, spikes fields, menacing earthworks, were all described as, and I quote, utilizing archetypal images whose physical forms embody and communicate meaning to deter inadvertent human interference. Beyond a mere scale or reference, the human presence illustrates the fact that these images are part of a world in which the human as visitor does not remain. Such images resonate of a deep ecology position which contends that vast areas of whole continents should be off limits to humans, messaging back and forth between the idea of wasteland and the idea of wilderness. As of 2010, the Chernobyl exclusion zone is, is exclusively an environmental recovery area with efforts devoted to remediation and re-enclosure of the reactor site. Environmental advocates have recommended making less contaminated portions of the site permanently off limits to allow for wild wildlife recovery and the habitat reserve. In his current research and upcoming film, Peter Gallison, historian of science at Harvard University, explores the intersections of forbidden wilderness and nuclear wasteland beyond a binary of purity and corruption. Removing parts of the earth in perpetuity, Gallison argues, for reasons of sanctification or despoilment presents us in a different relation to the physical world, raising irreducible questions about who we are when land can be classified forever as not for us humans. He invites us to think beyond the position of post-romantic tourists in a forbidden zone. It is the necessity to think wilderness as a category and of wasteland as the other half of the binary. As William Cronin, the environmental historian, has pointed out in The Trouble with Wilderness or Getting Back to the Wrong Nature, land has constantly been in motion in all sorts of ways. It is this political invitation that I have hoped to share this evening. How do we come to think about landscapes beyond zones that are free of destruction or development. Thank you. So uh, I'd also like to thank Jeanette and Eric uh, for organizing this event and inviting us all here to participate. Um, I hope you'll excuse me for my use of notes. I'm, I'm trying to stick to the five to seven minute uh, time frame that I was given. Uh, but I want to begin by making a perhaps an obvious statement that I am in no way an expert on nuclear energy. Um, our interest in nuclear energy is really an interest in the byproducts of existing systems of urbanization. Uh, and in fact, much of our design research is really predicated on a very simple premise, a kind of variation of Virilio's comment on technology, and that is that all urbanization regardless of aspirations towards total efficiency or intended lightness of touch produces some residual consequence that is too often pointed to as the failure of that system. So the familiar examples of these byproducts would be things like industrial solid waste, atmospheric emissions, reduction in land value, destruction of ecological habitat, or social and economic degradation of existing urban fabrics, all your favorite NIMBY uh, causes. And more often than not, these byproducts are considered solely in the pejorative never in the opportunistic. However, rather than understanding these byproducts as detrimental and focusing only on trying to mitigate or excise the collateral effects, we're actually interested in leveraging their presence into new hybrid forms of public realm and unexpectedly productive landscapes. So really, our research as a, as a design practice is interested in the byproducts of energy systems in general, not just nuclear energy, as potential occasions for urban speculation. In this context, we began looking at nuclear en energy precisely because it was so contentious, to point out that even something perceived to be so dangerous, so potentially environmentally degrading, that there is still enormous urbanistic opportunity in the existing situation if considered outside the lens of preconceptions. What catalyzed this interest for, see, not an expert, Simpsons. Uh, what catalyzed this interest for us was the kind of seeming disconnect between what the popular perceptions 
popular understanding of nuclear energy tended to be the mushroom cloud, the cooling tower, Blinky, the three-eyed fish, versus the physical reality of many of these facilities as sites of significant terrestrial and aquatic habitat. One of the most striking descriptions we came across early in our work, in our research, was the anecdote about bald eagles and ospreys and egrets nesting in the demilitarized zone established around Three Mile Island following the September 11 terrorist attacks. A sort of 500-yard security perimeter had been mandated by the federal government around all nuclear facilities and produced a territory of total human absence, resulting in an emergent ecological preserve of quality equal or better than any legislated state or federal protected wildlife area. So for us, the idea of nesting bald eagles a few hundred yards away from what is widely perceived to be the most uh, perceived to be the site of the United States' most significant nuclear accident seemed a situation ripe for investigation. It is from this initial research that we had become interested in the notion of expanding this emergent situation into a concept for a national energy park tied directly to nuclear energy, an idea that urbanistically conflated the two primary nationwide systems of federal territorialization, Eisenhower's interstate system and the national park system, into something that was more of an economic infrastructure and an ecological or environmental infrastructure. The second preoccupation of our work was an idea of what a national park meant in the 21st century. Uh, in some ways, for us, a project like the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, is far more compelling than, say, Yellowstone or Yosemite, if physically less spectacular. So we, by moving forward, we began to ask ourselves some rather basic questions. Instead of considering individually conflicting systems of infrastructure and preserve, why not consider it as a system of infrastructural preserve? Why not an economic energy ecology? Why not abandon the limiting binaries of nature versus urbanization and look to leverage the physical requirements of one system into an occasion for enhancing and expanding a seemingly contradictory system in order to produce new system, a new synthetic landscape? And why not overlay on top of this the sort of lattice of public realm and superficial maps of productivity just for good measure. The challenge that we encountered and what we are continuing to look at now is just how to scale this system of a national energy park. And in some ways, Fukushima, the Fukushima disaster actually answered this for us because the dire consequences of that event caused us to begin looking at the emergency planning that was in place here in the US that set out one, two, five, 10, and 50 mile radii of management, a disaster management for any future event. So we've chosen to use the likelihood of a disaster as the basis for organizing the National Energy Park typology, which is roughly the same as being struck and killed by lightning in your lifetime. The significance of this connection to disaster management results in a basic National Energy Park typology of approximately 7,800 square miles, or approximately the size of Massachusetts, uh, a little more than two and a half times the size of Yellowstone National Park. Now given the scale of this typology, the programmatic makeup of the National Energy Park would not be limited to just industrial production and ecological preserve, but would necessitate a compri a comprising a whole mix of land use practices and urbanistic activities, all organized under the veil of the National Energy Park. Currently, the Bureau of Land Management is the federal agency responsible for, quote, managing public land resources for energy production purposes, unquote and their work mostly relates to mining, drilling, and more recently sustainable energy production such as wind, solar, and geothermal. Though they may seem like the obvious agency in a, to manage a system like the National Energy Park, the reality is that they are missing an essential aspect from their mandate, and that aspect is the public realm, which maybe seems a little odd considering what we've heard about nuclear energy. Thus, a variation of the TVA model is perhaps closer to what we are describing than a conventional top-down federal agency. In fact, I would suggest that the notion of the public realm and the utility of other productive land use regimes within the National Energy Park are fundamentally essential to the efficacy of the proposal. If one considers the cultural significance of the interstate highway system and the national park system, there's a unique notion related to the kind of American ideal of bigness and sovereignty re represented by both that I would argue has served to infatuate the majority of the general public and thus the prolonged success and valuing of those two systems. If nuclear energy is to be embraced, and if this embrace is to occur in an ecologically and environmentally respectful way, the general public's engagement with the system needs to drastically increase, in particular its physical and perceptual engagement. By making the general public an active steward of a landscape related to nuclear, nuclear power, and by conceiving and implementing a landscape that is designed for the exception rather than the everyday, 
we were able to synthesize the conflicting priorities of economic growth, energy demands, and environmental protection into a new hybrid format of urbanization with the capacity to reorient how we consider the relationship of national energy systems and nat natural ecological systems. So thank you so much for your presentations, and um, I'm excited to see how we can try to um, kind of unpack and go a little bit further into some, many of the issues that you've all laid out here tonight. Um, but first, it seems appropriate to start with the question of fear. Um, it's, it's, it's part of the provocation for you, and I think each of you have touched upon it in different ways. And um, uh, Matt, for you, if, if we like worrying so much that it's um, that it's, in a, in a sense, coloring the way that we measure the cost and benefit of nuclear power. Um, Renia, if the, um, um, if the anticipation of um, um, waste management and storage 10,000 years from now leads us to a particular attitude towards um, a wasteland and or wilderness um, somewhere between development and destruction, um, does that lead us to a different conception of fear or anticipated risk? Um, Christopher, if your project is looking for opportunities within this kind of compromised landscape, um, does this appease us of our fear? Are we no longer scared in your projects? <laughs> so anyway, I, I just thought we could sort of start with this kind of question. Are we too afraid of nuclear power or um, are we not afraid enough? Uh, well, I'll make you more afraid. It's no longer 10,000 years. It's now a million years by a decision of the U.S. District Court, for the Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia. Uh, I, I think nuclear waste is like a Rorschach test. It reflects back on your uh, belief in the human ability to solve problems. And uh, once you believe you can't solve it, it'll keep you awake at night. Uh, at um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is now going through a proceeding to determine if you can leave the stuff where it is for 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. Uh, we will need some time to solve this problem. The problem with Yucca Mountain is it was chosen by the best geologists in the United States Senate. It just <laughs> didn't make a lot of sense from a geologic standpoint. It made sense from a political standpoint, which is it was a low population area and a state that had very little political clout. If you can leave the stuff where it is for two, 300 years, it'll be a lot easier to bury it sounds like you're kicking the can down the road, but actually the heat production will be so much lower that uh, you can pack it in closer and worry about it less. Uh, I think in the rational scheme of things, I'm probably more worried about global warming than I am about nuclear waste or nuclear accident. I don't think we're gonna locate all our power production in one place, that would make it kind of difficult. And even if you did in an area the size of the state of Massachusetts, people would want to live inside it. How are you going to get workers there? It takes 800 or 1,000 workers for each, uh, you know, each dozen megawatt plant. I mean, just to, just to clarify, that wasn't that wasn't where all the waste was going. That no, was that was where the reactors were going. That was where the reactor was going, assuming that the worst case scenario, they did in fact explode. Um, but to your point, the likelihood of that is diminished in comparison to many other catastrophic events that might, might take place. The point that, that we were simply trying to make is that any urbanization, any process of anthropogenic occupancy produces a consequence. And we seem more comfortable with, with some of those consequences than we are with others. Independent of their seriousness. Independent serious of the list. rationality yes. or uh, the, the reasoning for that. And so the argument was simply to say that um, if we look at these potential consequences, we can actually make something out of them or get people to have a, a closer relationship to those things. So the idea that if people become an active steward of a landscape that is organized or managed by nuclear power, they start to understand the process of nuclear power. They start to understand the system that's in place, what works, what doesn't, what are the things to, to worry about. 
and thus you're improving the overall system because you have a more you have more eyes essentially you have a you have a bigger constituency who's engaged with it the reality now is that the understanding of nuclear power within the united states is limited to the things that i mentioned mushroom clouds cooling towers and the simpsons so this is actually an opportunity to expand the exposure to the technology as a way of making it uh, more commonplace or more readily accepted. Moving it off to an isolated corner will not make it more no, understood. No, one, no, one, no, yeah. one's, no one's isolating it. We're, we're, we're saying that, perhaps it wasn't clear, we're saying that because of that scale, these things need to be occupied. The territories around well, them need to be occupied. As it, as it turns out, curiously, there's a, there's a technological solution that mimics your proposal, which is you could build a new class of reactors that would use the unused portion of fuel and nuclear waste and would break up the most long-lived, difficult-to-handle isotopes. But if you did that, you wouldn't want to move the fuel very far uh, because it's so radioactive. So you'd build new reactors next to the old ones. Mm -hmm. So you'd end up with clusters of reactors. The interesting part of the question as I come across some of the information as well is that many of the currently operating nuclear plants for civilian use are located east of the Mississippi. Most. And most of the considered um, geological depositories or any waste depositories have happened kind of in the west, in the desert. And there seems to be kind of a, that's kind of one of the issues that I was um, uh, focusing on, which is the externalization of waste and cost, which is part of many systems of energy and it seems that kind of the centralized potential that nuclear has in, uh, in, in dealing with many of the other environmental problems that systems such as coal and gas pose face this um, condition of not wanting to leave the waste on site and the eventual kind of shortlisting from a dozen potential waste sites into the state that has the least kind of uh, power and political representation, that being New Mexico, Nevada, I mean, right. you kind of don't want it to be in your state. The other part of kind of the question of fear is a question of the socialization of risk, as uh, as you probably touched upon it in an earlier session on, on risk more broadly, or Beck's perception that these risks are not necessarily about the likelihood of their happening in the future, but more the their incorporation in a way of addressing the, the question. So the nuclear age as being one of the major shapers of how we thought about the 1940s till the 1990s, roughly the period of the Cold War. And I thought kind of the um, uh, representative example of shifting the name of the Nevada test site from a Nevada test site, which, is, which was geared mostly towards nuclear energy to one which was the Nevada national, national security site is kind of very emblematic of a post 9-11 world where we're now kind of dealing with an a new kind of a big fear category, which is that of national security, not one that has by any means emerged in, a, in, in the 21st century, but that has kind of acquired a predominance. So if, say, um, uh, Apple II, which is maybe one of a very currently viewed film when you try to look for some scenes of widely shared representations um, into uh, nuclear test, was basically the construction of a typical American suburb. It's, it's uh, your individual house, a street, a school, a church, and then the detonation by the dropping of a bomb. And that kind of, it was populated not by humans. I mean, that wasn't necessarily the case in all test sites. Some actually included human inhabitants, so not even the question of radiation in 10 million years. A bomb was dropped in a place that was inhabited. But the question of a shared imagery that had mannequins, kind of representations of human incorporating a space, and the and the reinforce, reinforcement of a, the imagined me of a risk that could be that kind of is very well, representative of the question of nuclear, which is that coupling of the bomb and of energy, which is we, I think we should, pretty specific. We should point out that the two things run together in the public imagination. But the Nevada test site was testing weapons. The waste isolation pilot plant is burying military materials, Correct. and those are not power materials. Correct. Along those lines, though, it seems that we could try to focus on the, the kinds of geographies that we do track or over track or under track when we talk about the landscapes of nuclear power. Um, that, and the, the, the 50 mile buffer is certainly prominent in our imagination today, especially following the 
the U.S. government's recommendation of, of the um, evacuation of the 50-mile area around Fukushima. Um, and so we talk about 10-mile buffers, we talk about 50-mile buffers, but we can also track these waste sites in the, the states, as, as, Rene, as Rene is pointing out, in the states that don't commonly run nuclear power. Um, I'd be curious to see what kind of tools we have to track these geomet geographies and how they're influencing our understanding of this impact of nuclear power. I think one, one uh, there's actually a, a pair of diagrams that I kind of wish I had left into my presentation, <laughs> which is one where you look at the sort of population density of the United States and you hit the I-35 corridor in the middle of the country and you basically have a mid-coast, right, where the, the population is ostensibly on the eastern half of the country until you really get to the, the west coast. The other diagram that I think is super interesting, and, and it's kind of a chicken or the egg, is the, the mapping of the amount of federally owned land within the western states. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, where you have literally 85% of Nevada federally owned. You have 40% uh, of Utah federally owned. But when you get on the east, eastern half of the United States, where the majority of the nuclear power facilities are, that number is 0.3%, 0.1%, 0.6%. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge kind of, it's, 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 it's this sort of, this is the situation that we have, this is our repository because these are the, the lands that we, that we own. In some way, they're already in place. There was a plan for a western repository and then an eastern repository. Uh, they had so much trouble picking yucca and forcing that through and finally giving up on it. The Energy Department said fairly recently, I think two years ago, that for the time being there was no need to find a second repository. It's a sort of moot point because they can't find the first repository. I was in Portland, Maine for a hearing by, it was then the Atomic Energy Commission, it was before the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, uh, on the possibility of locating nuclear waste in the granite um, on the New Hampshire Maine border. And there were protesters who lined the road all the way from the airport to the auditorium where the hearing was held, uh, even though the granite, the granite plutons are probably a better structure than the volcanic ridge at Yucca Mountain. I think that the 10 mile and 50 mile zones are a little bit misunderstood. They were established after Three Mile Island. Ten miles is the area within which the Nuclear Regulatory Commission said you should determine how many people live there and if you told them to evacuate, how long it would take them. Fifty miles is the area in which they said you should keep track of where the dairy farms are, or where farms are, and where you might have to sequester food. The 50-mile zone doesn't mean a whole lot because in a country like this, it's, it's difficult to imagine we couldn't get enough food together to feed an area even if there were a radioactive release. In fact, neither one of the zones has been used so far. That's not to say they couldn't ever be. Uh, but there's nothing to say that if you did have a release that it would stop at 10 miles or 50 miles. The, one of the lessons of Fukushima is the maximum dose that you can produce off-site is probably smaller than we used to think it was. Although you can end up with enough environmental, contamin environmental contamination that you're going to have a problem reoccupying the area. It's interesting to see in your maps the 50 mile zone essentially cover the entire northeast corridor. I mean, I, I, I'm not quite sure how to clarify it. Just this notion of understanding the 50 miles is a, is a construct and the fact that no matter what system we use, there's going to be degradation, there's going to be risk embedded in that system. In some ways, we were simply pointing out the scale of the system that's perceived to be the most dangerous, when in fact, as you told us, it's it, it, the it least may or may not be the most dangerous, Correct. right? Um, so far, it isn't. So there, there's this seeming, there's, it's, it's a question for us that we, that we try to engage internally, which is why are, why are some byproducts, why are some residual effects accepted whereas others aren't? And in either case, is there a way to reposition those or reframe those so they're not per perceived as uh, degenerative but actually perceived as being potentially opportuni opportunities within the system? What I find pretty challenging about these uh, uh, zones that are imposed is that they're kind of by definition human-centered as a mode of framing the question of the environment. 
while posing, while operating under the larger umbrella of ecology. So it's more of a concern of who lives there and how could this area eventually be repopulated. And less the question that uh, a nuclear explosion does not end at the immediate kind of uh, uh, repercussions it has on, on, the, on the human system. Um, well, it turns out to be good for the animals. Any area yeah, that you that's evacuate. That's what I was kind of, that's the other kind of flip part of the coin, which becomes kind of a, currently a revival of nuclear tourism in many of these facilities or the imposition of an environmental zone in zones that were no longer inhabited. So you'd be, I mean, I was very surprised to know that the Bikini Atoll site is currently one of the most popular diving destinations in the world, the fifth most popular destination. And there's kind of a celebration of an environment that was able, to, an ecology that was able to regenerate itself when human presence was no longer there. Chernobyl has a kind of a current environmental zoning that projects into the future a possibility of that zone becoming a, a, a tourist site. The Nevada test site has already an obelisk and many of these kind of um, areas are already incorporated into the circuits of tourism more generally, but particularly a niche of ecological tourism, which celebrates uh, the depopulation of the area. And this is why I feel we get closer to that idea of wilderness. We're, we're, we're almost celebrating the abandonment of human population in the area because it promises a revival of that long lost kind of uh, um, nature that, uh, that our occupation of the land has happened. So one of the examples that I appreciated in, in Peter Gallison's thoughts was the idea of, um, of uh, well, how do you regulate for uh, any species of elephants that is under the risk of extinction, rather than banning kind of firearms by giving incentives to the people who actually depend on them for their livelihood. So we don't, it's not a separation of the question of nature and, and humans, kind of forcing an operation into separate realms, but by understanding that the existence of human of humans is part of the unfolding of nature and to allow for a possibility that they could actually operate not under a condition of wasteland and not under a condition of wilderness, which is uh, a big challenge, I feel, when we're dealing with questions of, uh, of ecology and waste on, on, on both ends of the spectrum. It's interesting that in the Gallison example that um, he cites this kind of deep ecologist perspective that it, it might actually be okay for there to be radioactivity in some of these sites if it keeps development at bay. Um, and I, I think that does exactly bring, bring to question this issue of the role in hum of humans in managing this landscape or um, managing it precisely neither as wasteland nor as wilderness. And I'd be curious to hear your perspectives on what type of management this then points to or what kind of hybrid in, in this sense, are we leading to? The Hanford nuclear site where they produced the plutonium used in Nagasaki was 540 square miles. Just to save money after production ceased there, they pulled in the perimeter and left about 200 square miles unoccupied. It had been farmland, orchards, etc., and it has reverted to wilderness. The Rocky Mountain Arsenal near Denver, never nuclear, simply uh, chemical weapons, other weapons. Uh, the buffer zone between the Turkish and the um, Greek parts of Cyprus have all become, they're not managed, they're reverted, they're feral. And they've all managed quite nicely without us. You know, I think it's, particularly in a country at the scale of the US, I think this question of what needs to be managed versus what doesn't is, is sort of essential. Um, you know, the, the Bureau of Land Management, which is this entity that's involved with drilling and, and mining uh, various other uh, operations, um, I think th the point that these things manage without our active engagement is, is the kind of essential one. Uh, we don't actually need to manage them. What I see as the kind of interesting opportunity is that we could manage them, that we could anticipate uh, the kind of degradation, that we could anticipate the, the disaster, um, and start to sort of speculate about what, what the potentials of that thing are, rather than saying, okay, we'll respond to it. What if we anticipate it? What if we put out on the table 
uh, a sort of potential configuration or organizational idea. Um, this, this goes back to this idea of the binary of wilderness versus urbanized uh, nature versus, versus the city, which I think is, is a kind of, it's, it's limiting. We can't, we can't go anywhere with that. I think we need to understand that basically any place where man has, has stepped is urban. Uh, any place where there is no occupancy, which is uh, nowhere because of the, the, the flows of, of the atmosphere, uh, is not. So th this notion of wilderness, um, for me, is a, is a difficult one because it, it, it's, 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 a, it's a falsity in some regards. And the risks aren't really gone, when we, even when we talk about this landscape reverting to wilderness. The risks that we've talked about in the beginning of our discussion are still there. The Soviet Union had an explosion of military nuclear wastes in the southern Urals in the late 50s. And they cordoned off a large area. And they thought they had the problem contained. And then they realized there are flocks of migratory birds that were picking up uh, uh, contamination. Zoris Mendevev wrote a wonderful book about this. So the Red Army came in and slaughtered all the migratory birds. Uh, a certain extent of uh, Contamination may be protective, but beyond that, it becomes destructive to whatever's contaminated. Mm -hmm. Are there questions from the audience? And then just in terms of talking about um, the footprint of nuclear energy, it seems like nuclear landscapes blur when it's between nuclear power and nuclear waste. So I don't really see a difference between Yucca Mountain and what's happened in Fukushima. So when we're citing nuclear power plants, it seems important to factor in uranium mines, large spaces that we excavate out of the earth, and to somehow simplify the definition of nuclear energy as being this small footprint is just such a... Um, misleading thing to say. Um, and I have been to so many of these discussions and really feel like I was hoping for something different to happen tonight because we're amongst designers and architects, creative people, and it feels like we have the same answers over and over again rather than thinking of new directions or new possibilities in terms of turning things back to consumers or the user end of energy. And between 20 to 40 percent of electricity is wasted in our homes. And so we could easily shut off our computers or just become more aware of how much energy we use and resolve this issue. There would be no ways to deal with. There would be no emissions to deal with. But yet we never talk about that. Instead, we say, just wait you know, another 70 years and maybe we'll design a solution for all this nuclear waste. And it just feels like there's so many other discussions to have. And it just really gets to me. Um, <laughs> and I actually interviewed Peter Gallison. And that interview has been cited a lot tonight um, on my blog, Friends of the Pleistocene. So this is an issue really dear to my heart, and so I'm just hoping to have like a broader discussion that maybe brings it into reality about what's happening on the planet right now for people who are living in Japan who have lived this out and the possibility of that happening here or elsewhere because it has happened. Thanks. The biggest spatial problem in the nuclear cycle is mill tailings because when you run a uranium mine, only a small portion is uranium oxide. The rest is all sorts of other stuff. And when you take out the uranium oxide, you don't get all of it. So we end up with these big piles of dust that have nasty stuff in them. Uh, this is not true only of uranium mines. There's all kinds of mill tailings. But if you're looking for the big part of the footprint that is not at the power plants, in fact, it's bigger than the power plants, it's the mill tailings. The extent of the problem in Japan is not yet clear. There are several competing things happening. One is there are still short-lived isotopes that will burn themselves out in the coming months and years. The other is you've got to figure out how much you can reasonably clean things up and how much you need to clean things up. There's a lively debate going about the effects of small doses of radiation. The experience of the Soviets and later the Ukrainians was that you can draw lines around places and say, don't go there, but people tend to go back there anyway. 
what exact dose they receive and what the health effects will be will probably be clearer later. They're not clear right now. I was up in Maine in Wiscasset where they tore down the Maine Yankee nuclear plant. There's a EPA rule that says if you're going to release a site for unrestricted access, the dose to a member of the public can't be more than 25 millirem a year. 25 millirem is about what you and I get in the course of a month from natural sources. So they're saying you shouldn't get more than 13 months worth of radiation in a year. State of Maine said, no, no, that's too high. We're going to make it 20 millirem a year. The dose was calculated as being if you had a subsistence farmer who did irrigated farming and drilled his well in the dirtiest spot and then used that contaminated water to water all of his food. There are some, this is a very conservative hypothesis. There are some problems with it. First of all, Maine doesn't have much irrigated farming. It has virtually no subsistence farming. This is a site adjacent to the Wiscasset Airport. It's on a railway line. It's got utilities. It's not going to be a farm. It's going to be a new industrial site of some kind. But they went ahead and cleaned it up to the extent that nobody would get more than 20 millirem a year. And they eventually discovered simply testing the materials to see if they were radioactive enough to give you 20 millirem a year in your subsistence farm was too complicated. So they loaded train load after train load of rocks and dirt and rubble and shipped it to Clive, Utah, where it's buried. This was not a particularly productive exercise. There are better things the money could have been spent on to improve human health and safety. In fact, the money would have been better off sitting in the pockets of the ratepayers of the state of Maine. The site is still unused, however, because the nuclear waste is still sitting there. Uh, it's in casks. The difference between Yucca and Fukushima is that the nuclear wastes are very well contained. Fukushima is not <coughs> well contained. I think we have to make rational use of resources and space, and I don't think we're doing that very well these days. I also think that the wastes that come, look at the TVA, which was cited here. They dumped what, 10 million gallons of um, uh, sludge from a coal pile filled with arsenic, lead, other stuff. We are surrounded by wastes. We ought to address them in order. Uh, nuclear, the nuclear cycle just is not particularly land intensive. Meanwhile, we're out there putting up solar cells with arsenic in them. Someday that'll come back and bite us. I appreciate your series of questions, and I think they hint into uh, many s interesting directions that we could discuss. Um, I do find that some of the issues you're raising are a bit uh, kind of, th they take us in different directions. Let me say why. Because I feel the question of footprint does expand our understanding of energy production beyond the moment of crisis. And I would say that I'm, on the other hand, I'm very happy tonight that we haven't centered the discussion on Fukushima, not because I don't think that this is an important aspect to discuss, but because I think there is a, uh, where we, we don't do our understanding of energy systems good if we restrict it to moments of crisis. And again, Peter Gallison, since uh, you're you're familiar with his work, and because he's he's written recently as well on the uh, the Gulf oil spill that we've had recently, which is the moment when an issue comes to visibility, just because the system is no longer operating in the way that it's supposed to be. So, by addressing the question of the geographic footprint of nuclear, by focusing on the whole chain of production from the extraction of uranium to the power plant, and eventually to the question of waste, we're actually moving away from a model that wants to focus on moments of Fukushima, Three Mile Island, and Chernobyl as the exclusive moments of consideration in a history of nuclear energy, and expanding the understanding to one that occupies a lot of the geography of Africa and the question of extraction. Gabriel Esht has a forthcoming book that actually looks at these different regions of extraction in Africa and traces their repercussions in the way we understand nuclear energy. And you're right, it's a very important aspect to look at an extensive footprint and not just the, the moment where the nuclear reactor is in operation and to say that this has a limited environmental impact on the face of the earth because, well, it doesn't. Uh, arguments for or against extraction of uranium of Africa have led to actual wars um, and arguments that weren't constructed very long ago. And again, Ash would be an, uh, an expert to deal with that. Um, and then I think the question, the very important question on where do we focus the discussion? So not only moments of crisis, but instances of thinking about consumption versus production. And this is a, uh, a challenging one because it assumes that we're, there's 
uh, we're, we're not addressing the aspect of the consumption question and we're leaving the, the production the way it is. But the way we've come to rely more significantly on fossil fuels is not an accident. We've come to use more and more energy by design. By the, we've built more capacity in the electric lines before we were able to fill them. So there was, uh, whether through electric utilities or many of the other moments and technologies that rely heavily on fossil fuels, the system has been designed for an overcapacity, for an overconsumption. So to look into these moments will help us to, re to kind of reflect on systems of production, but it kind of does not, uh, it, it, it's not by accident that we kind of focus on the question of production because it's by design that it has been reduced to this capacity. Um, the use of uh, nuclear power uh, in the military, but not for destructive purposes, but for uh, transportation purposes through aircraft carriers or submarines. Um, particularly, Matthew, can you give us any sense on um, like the the amount of material that's in that's in the, the military currently? And can you comment with any kind well, of? Well, as they say in Washington, that's classified. <laughs> I can tell you, but then I'd have to kill you. Um, the uh, yes, a, a civilian power reactor, depending on its, its vintage and design, is, has an active fuel zone on the order of, of uh, 12 or 14 feet high. It, it's got a diameter in the range of 25 or 30 feet. Uh, a submarine reactor uses high enriched uranium. It will sustain a, a, a fast neutron criticality. It will blow up like a bomb uh, if given the opportunity. And it's much more dense, and it's more on the order of the size of a 55-gallon drum. Uh, the, s the Russians still run, and I think, in fact, are still building uh, nuclear-powered icebreakers. Uh, we had a civilian ship, the Savannah, which was nuclear-powered, but it was not economic. Uh, the Yucca Mountain was supposed to be for civilian wastes and also military wastes, some of which are the remnants of bomb production and some of which are from propulsion reactors. We do run a fleet of, I don't know how many, probably around 100 uh, nuclear powered vessels, submarines and um, uh, aircraft carriers. Did that answer the question? To some degree, but also I was just curious as to the, I mean, again, like the, however much we're able to know about it, but the, the degree to which uh, that those, you know, like what's the, what's the lifespan of a, of a submarine? <laughs> I mean, is it the same as, like, is, is it the same as, a, as a nuclear power plant? Where no, it's much shorter. Um, they load them with huge amounts of fissile uranium, run them for about 10 years without refueling, bring them back, cut a hole in the hull, pull out the core and put in a new one, run them another 10 years. Uh, we've been replacing them after about 20 years. If you had to, you could probably run one longer, but uh, the Pentagon prefers to build new ones. I don't know as much about carrier reactors. Uh, I don't think you have to drill a hole in those. Those carriers usually carry more than one reactor, uh, but the, the, the engineering design is very different. They're designed to run for years and years without refueling, and they do more than run the, propel the ship, they also on a, on a uh, submarine, they make oxygen. On a um, carrier, they make water, uh, drinking water, desalinate water, mm. which you could do, you could imagine doing in future on land. Uh, th you may get to the point where you don't want to use oil and gas to desalinate water anymore. You want to use reactors. Uh, it depends on how much you're willing to pay for the water, how badly you need it, how much capital you've got what your options are. Is that other question? To what extent was each pond impacted by sloshing of water due to the earthquake and also to the fracturing and, and leaking there, thereof because of these water tanks that were in structures that were above the actual reactor. In other words, it was a problem just waiting for disaster, and, and I wonder if the sloshing, was that a big factor? Well, 
Uh, there's another reactor complex in Japan whose name escapes me at the moment that had an earthquake about four years ago where they did get sloshing out of the pool, but the pool was still intact. Uh, at Fukushima, uh, because of the design of the reactor, the space is above the pools filled with hydrogen and then exploded, so now they've got debris in the pools. Uh, the reason for the 50-mile evacuation recommendation is the N Nuclear Regulatory Commission decided one of the pools was empty or almost empty, but they now decided they were wrong. It always had water in it. Uh, th these are things in precise geometry with carefully controlled chemistry that are now wrecked, but the, the fuel is still presumably intact and in the pools. That's what they brought in the fire hoses, the, the pumper trucks, to try to keep full. And in fact, you've got to keep adding water to them because they're warm and they will boil away eventually. Uh, the, the, the pool, you get an up and down fuel assembly. You put it down towards the bottom of the pool and usually you have 20 or 30 feet of water above it. And no, I don't think any of that was exposed. I wonder if we could, um, I, are there many more questions? I, by the way, I've not seen those pools. I've seen GE pools of, of similar design in this country. I wonder if we could quickly hear really all of the questions and then we could sort of respond generally because I'd be curious to hear what people are generally thinking in the audience. So maybe start with, um, uh, sir, I saw, you, I saw you, you raise your hand first. I was wondering if you can have a nuclear powered aircraft carrier, uh, has there been any work done on uh, siting nuclear power plants out to sea, like a large floating plant run the transmission line out on the seabed, and you wouldn't be near any population area, so that would be one thing you don't have to worry about. There's a reactor running in South Carolina that was a prototype for one you'd put on a barge. Uh, it's been running for years. Westinghouse had this plan for barge-mounted reactors. The Russians are, right now are trying to sell such a reactor to Manila. You, uh, it wouldn't be out at sea. It would be tethered at the end of a pier. Uh, it doesn't give me complete comfort. Is it New Jersey also that's not running? Uh, floating reactors, probably, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I, I just want to know from the second speaker. Uh, you said something about 1982 Nuclear Waste Act. I want to know uh, the provisions of that act. I'd, I'd be happy to. If Please. I'm no, Nuclear Waste <laughs> Policy Act of 1982 established three sites for as lead candidates for evaluation for a repository, established that the United States was going to bury the waste, was not going to reprocess it. The first of the three candidates was Yucca. Later on, it was amended to say, skip the other two, just do Yucca. Uh, it also gave the states the authority and the responsibility for, for disposing of low-level wastes. It established a fee of one-tenth of one cent per kilowatt hour which has now accumulated into tens of billions of dollars for disposal of waste, making nuclear waste the world's ugliest bride with the world's largest dowry. <laughs> and um, it had a few other provisions in it. Uh, it set the 10,000 year standard, but that was thrown out by a court and is now a million years. We could touch on uh, the thing that was touched on a little bit, which is the sort of geopolitical implications of the industrial and economic relationships between different types of energy production and nuclear, so whether um, regional conflicts or regional attitudes are tied to um, which, kind of which kind of power production is happening there and how that relates, and then also whether that influences sort of imagery and the sort of perception that um, colors and, and influences those opinions. Somebody please answer. I mean, um, if you take a look at the series of James Bond 007, since they've been produced, you can see a series of geological, of geological, geopolitical threats and the way we've proposed to deal with them in our imaginaries. So anything from, from Russia with love to the latest that traces the establishment of the Baku, Tbilisi, Jehan pipeline and kind of endows the agent with the responsibility of ensuring that oil runs through. So there is a kind of a, a geopolitical negotiation when it comes to thinking about infrastructures of energy. The tricky part is that as designers, um, 
they kind of bring us an understanding of space as, a, as an empty container somehow in which it's only political interest that could actually materialize the implementation of a, of a line. So their interest is mostly in the planning phase. Once the infrastructure is put in place and running, it kind of disappears from all account, which leads into questions, questions of the larger geographic impact of a big system that requires extraction, transport, distribution, and then waste. But, but also only reappears in moments of crisis. So we only come to talk about, again, uh, uh, reactors or, or pipelines at the moment of, of interruption of flow or at the moment of, uh, of, of leakage, which is kind of tricky as, as a kind of a discourse to look through for, for, for us, I guess. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in this dynamic of, uh, you know, wilderness and wasteland. And, and you know, one of the things that it brings to mind is that some, you know, thinking of the question of the sort of thriving of ecosystems, right? And, and I think that, uh, Christopher, your proposal seems to posit a sort of, um, I mean, not a, you know, not a, a, a pure state, right? I mean, I don't think you're adding those value, you know, valuing in that sense, but a sort of notion that it can return to something else or that there's some, you know, that the eagles get to sort of fly there again, that sort of thing. And so I'm curious because, you know, one of the, um, the science of ecology, right, uh, initiated in part by the planting of, of radioactive material, right, at, at Oak Ridge, and, and this sort of notion of how we understand impacts of, of human systems on natural systems, et cetera. So how do we begin to formulate uh, a sort of index almost, or sort of record keeping that would allow us to maybe modulate our energy choices? I mean, I'm kind of trying to get back to this consumption question too, which is I think not a, an important one, right? And, and, and it, perhaps what we fear in the end is less nuclear power, but sort of ourselves, right? And we have no capacity to regulate ourselves in terms of our electricity use, so we look to other things. But is, is there a way, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, thinking of your map in the, in the 50 uh, yard radii and sort of thinking of a way to kind of index uh, uh, a sort of power use, power source, and their kind of sense of ecological uh, thriving right, relative to that, and if there's a, I mean, to sort of take your presentation, you know, the, the project you guys are working on and, and expand it as a sort of user guide, right, to uh, hmm. power systems, not that you then can in any way choose necessarily. No, but I mean, it evidently was not, not clear uh, in, in what we were sort of laying out that it wasn't, the, the notion of the, the bald eagles that came back to nest was not intended to suggest that we create a 50 mile barrier at which nobody goes. Uh, it's actually quite the opposite. The intention was to create a sort of landscape or a, a, a synthetic landscape in which all of these things are happening simultaneously. Um, and that by that increased level of exposure, there a certain understanding, a certain uh, awareness is created. And so I guess, um, you know, going back to some of the prior questions, our position is simply that existing systems, whether they're geographic, whether they're political, whether they're climactic, um, all have consequence. And if we're able to, to begin to just accept that and operate within the consequence, uh, it's perhaps a, perhaps a more useful notion than trying to abandon and replace, you know, with sort of a technological optimism that somehow something else will, will allow us to, to get rid of that thing. Um, it's simply it's simply a position that's useful to demonstrate the fact that there actually are symbioses that could be made if we actually called them out. And perhaps this goes back to your question about how do we map them, how do we index those things. And I I think in some ways the the sh the act of documenting, but then making projection, not just mapping them, because I think that's maybe one of the one of the dangers is that we can we can trace these things, we can we can spatialize these things in some way, but I think we, as designers, owe it to ourselves to at least put out a speculation about what we could do with them. Um, whether or not it's, it's completely accurate or completely correct or 100% uh, verifiable is perhaps beyond the point. It's more to make the, to indicate that the opportunity is there if we were to engage that as a practice model, um, which I think in the general getting away from nuclear in the context of where we're talking about this is a really critical point, that we're not just documenting, but we're making projections and then perhaps inserting ourselves into that conversation. I wonder if to wrap up the discussion, if that, if, if your two comments uh, 
kind of point to this divide that's, that we're always confronting between product production and consumption on the one end, between the sites of um, energy production and um, waste uh, storage on the other hand. And if some of these kinds of uh, spaces and uh, technologies and techniques are ways to try to link or make sense of those, thing, those landscapes which we normally don't consider together. Um, the Cool Biz campaign comes to mind in Japan that um, we start to see office workers in Tokyo dressing differently because of um, the government's campaign to um, reduce consumption. Um, and yet that world does tend to be quite different from the highly, highly centralized, large-scale infrastructure that Matt um, uh, laid out for us. So I thought I would just end with a question about power, essentially, that if literally, uh, <laughs> both senses of power and, and uh, literally, that um, if nuclear power entails a very centralized, large-scale um, right level of regulation, production, um, really at every stage in its, in its um, supply chain, what do we make then of the relative roles of elected officials, government regulators, utilities, citizens in confronting nuclear power? And I think as Daniel has pointed to, how do we then index or track or respond to this ongoing uncertain infrastructure? The electric system works well because it's interconnected. You can have individual grids that are not connected, but they don't work as well. Their costs are higher, they're dirtier, they're less reliable. Nuclear power, it's hard to run one reactor. You're better off running 20 or 50. You're better off having some economy of scale, having a knowledge base, having resources you can share. That, by the way, is also true of, of coal, natural gas, and some other things. We live in a country that is now highly dependent on uh, complex interrelated systems. If the electric system gets knocked out for some extended period, pretty soon we'd starve. We'd want for drinking water. Uh, the ability of the average member of the public to deal, to confront, as you put it, with nuclear power with um, how much E. coli should be allowed in your food, with what vaccinations you ought to get or not get um, is becoming a challenge because the policy decisions, the policy setup is not well geared to making technical decisions. And I don't exactly know how to answer the question except to say it's not a problem limited to nuclear power. I, I think from this discussion, I mean, the, the thing, the, it's like that, I, how do you turn a ship on a dime kind of thing, how do you turn a truck carrier on a dime? Because the reality is that these infrastructure systems in the U.S. are single service dumb systems. They only do one thing, and, and they, in most cases, don't do it very well. Um, and if we look back to the kind of idea of ecology, in ecology there is no waste. Right, because something's waste if something else is food. Um, there's always an opportunity to consume it in somehow. And so if we assume that these existing systems of infrastructure are dumb and singular, I think we owe it to ourselves to start to think about how we could bundle and, and, and synthesize those with other systems that seemingly are in conflict, but could actually occupy and consume that waste, whatever that waste product is, whether it's spatial, whether it's physical, whether it's political. And that if we're able to do that, that would actually start to suggest possibilities for transformation. So it's, it's in some ways, as designers, it is demonstrating the, ca the capacity to bundle, to, to synthesize, rather than continuing to operate in the singularity within, within which most infrastructural systems are designed, implemented, and operated. And I think that there's a role as well in observing these dividing lines that are established socially. So if one role that speculative design can play is that it starts to disturb that kind of reinforce aspects that we've come to accept as, as, as risk and, uh, and dividing lines between categories of production or consumption. So it's less their, that's how I see most of their productive capacity, not necessarily as, as projects that would materialize one day, but as <coughs> moments that could start to pinpoint impossibilities of 
are they are they reconcilable categories within that and what are some of the possible ways for us to think about the production of energy and the occupation of space as not necessarily exclusive paradigms but ones that could be reconciled somehow what the form that that would take the technology and the geography that that would deploy um, would be very interesting uh, proposals to see but already asking the question of what lies in those dividing line is a political responsibility I think I think that's a great place to end the discussion and um, I'm excited to think about how designers can then respond to this next question that if it's neither pro nor con but we actually have to start forming new sorts of relationships between these kind of uh, risk infrastructure <laughs> infrastructures I think that would be a really great next step for the conversation um, thank you so much for coming. Thank you, Jim. Thank you for the speakers. Thank you.